Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, striking up the live stream on a Friday morning to bring you some more Miami football talk. Uh, the Hurricanes, of course, concluding ACC kickoff uh, earlier this week on a Wednesday in Charlotte with Mark Richt and players uh, trying to give you some different perspectives on Miami football. You may remember that uh, Isaiah Kim Martinez, the uh, sports editor at uh, the Miami Hurricane, had joined us a number of times uh, during the offseason to talk Miami football. It's always interesting to get the on-campus student perspective of Miami football, the fans, the, the, the students right there, uh, and what they think about the Hurricanes. And we will do so for 2018 with uh, Josh White, who is uh, currently the sports uh, editor there at uh, Miami Hurricane and also the sports director at the campus uh, station uh, WVUM905. Uh, Josh, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. Appreciate you doing this for the first time. Welcome. We talk to uh, bloggers, broadcasters, writers all over the uh, country uh, about uh, college football. So Miami's just a, a small slice of it, but a uh, very important slice. Uh, the, the Canes fans are very fervent about Miami football. So we appreciate you coming on board. Uh, remind everybody out there to like, comment, and subscribe. And of course, if you prefer the audio, just go to Google Play, Podbean, iTunes, and Stitcher. Just search Mark Rogers TV right there as we get you set for 2018. Uh, Mark Richt uh, speaking at uh, the ACC kickoff. Uh, Josh, anything in particular that uh, stood out to you? There were a couple things that what Coach Rick said kind of missed out. Uh, the one thing that seemed like it was kind of clear cut, but Mark Rick kind of put it right out there was Malik Rozier is going to be the starting quarterback week one. That was expected from, I think, the fan base, expected by experts, if you will, uh, especially with that game being against LSU at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. So I think that was kind of expected, but he went out and said that. Um, that being said, you I mean, they have some very talented quarterbacks on their depth chart. Nikosi Perry, who came in last year and redshirted. Cade Weldon, who came in and redshirted last year. They bring in an incoming freshman, Jaron Williams, who spent the spring on campus. I think all three of those guys, he wants to see them compete for that backup job. He didn't necessarily tab a backup QB yet, but it seems like Malik's going to be the starter with one of those three as the number two. And really what Mark Rick loved about that situation is now that you have the new redshirt rule where you can play up to four games, that is, that's going to allow him to play Jaron Williams up to four games. He spoke about trying to get them in time against whether it's Savannah State Toledo, FIU, some of those weaker opponents in the earlier parts of the season, something he didn't have the flexibility to do last year with Cade Weldon and, and Nikosi Perry. So how does that translate to the rest of the offense? Uh, because it seems as though from a skill position standpoint, everything's in place. Uh, very good running back from last year in Travis Homer, an upcoming uh, back in DJ Dallas. Uh, the recruiting was out of its mind, uh, bringing in Lorenzo Lingard, one of the very best in the nation. The playmakers on the outside don't only have to run through them, and that was even with a hobbled Amon Richards. Uh, maybe a question mark at tight end, but uh, uh, plenty of talent, uh, young talent there. The offensive line, maybe that's another uh, – that's going to have to – uh, make it all go. Obviously, offensive line play is crucial. But uh, from a skill position standpoint, it, it it appears as though everything is very much in place from an experience and from a talent perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they add a lot more depth with the recruiting class. Like you mentioned, Lorenzo Lingard comes in. He might be their number three back. He could be an All-American in the future. But I mean, you have Travis Homer is one of the best running backs in the country. You have DJ Dallas, who broke out last year. He's added on some more weight, really transitioning to that running back spot. Lorenzo Lingard behind that. Cam Davis, who, as talented as ever, a four-star recruit, who knows how much playing time he's going to get. You talk about the playmakers on the outside. You I mean you have Amon Rich, you have so many other names to list. Lawrence Cager, Darrell Langham. They bring in Brian High High Hightower, Mark Pope. So many guys on the outside that they have. You talk about the tight end spot. They bring in two very talented tight ends. Revan Jordan and Will Mallory. So like you talked about, it's going to be crucial to have a consistent quarterback. And that's something that may have lacked last season is Malik Gozier was very good at times, but he was a little inconsistent. He wasn't necessarily ready for the starting quarterback job week in and week out. He battled a little bit of an injury and that may have played a part, but at ACC kickoff, Amon Richards, Mark Richt and Jaquan Johnson all spoke about how he's become more consistent. He's become more consistent, not just on the field, but off the field in a leadership aspect. And that's something that he had, kind of prided himself on to improve concerning he was just always the backup to Brad Kaya, but now he's taking it upon himself knowing that he's the starter week one. Josh, as you know, there is uh, much controversy surrounding Malik Rozier 
if somebody didn't watch Miami football last year and just picked up a stat sheet, they'd see, I believe, 28 touchdowns, uh, about 31 yards, 3,100 yards passing. And uh, it looks pretty prolific. Uh, watching the games, watching the missed throws, knowing that his receivers bailed him out, or uh, just because of the talent on the outside, were able to turn uh, small chunks of yardage into huge gains. Uh, the, the the play just wasn't good down the stretch. It seemed as though he regressed uh, at the same time he played two of the best defenses in the country uh, the final two games of the season. Your thoughts about Malik Rozier? What are you hearing on campus? One of the great things, as I mentioned off the top, is is getting you, who's got a uh, pulse on the, uh, uh, the student section in, in campus in regards to Miami football. Based on what I've heard, Malik Rozier is the most ready quarterback. He was the most ready quarterback last season, and that's kind of why he was a starting quarterback last year. He's going to be the starting quarterback week one. Um, there's all the tools in the world for Nikosi Perry, just maybe has not picked it up as quick as people would have thought. Um, he's a very talented thrower, a very talented runner, um, but you kind of hear talk that he might be a little more inaccurate at the moment than Malik Rozier is, and that's why Rozier's getting the starting nod again. Um, there's the highest praises in the world. For Jaron Williams, who came in as a true freshman in the spring as an early enrollee, I don't think Mark Rick's going to hand him the keys just yet. But I think he could be Mark Rick's guy in the near future. I think Jaron Williams could be the quarterback in the near future, maybe not this season. But I think you'll see him get a shot if Malik Rozier were to struggle. It would either be Williams or Naya. We're on the line with Josh White. Uh, he is uh, the sports editor and also sports director for both the radio stations and uh, the um, newspaper there, the online newspaper, of course, uh, at the University of Miami, Miami Hurricane and WVUM 905. Uh, Josh, we appreciate you coming on board. Uh, this is always a good discussion, and we're already getting uh, a ton of comments concerning Miami football. Uh, the defensive front seven was one of the best in college football last year. Uh, mm, there were some losses right up front. Uh, the, the, the linebackers, uh, as far as I know, all coming back. Um, that has to be um, a great source of, of, of reliance and, and uh, comfort knowing that uh, the defense should be extremely stout. Yeah, the front seven, like you mentioned, one of the best in the country last year. As a defense in total, they were tied for third in turnovers obviously the turnover chain and, and added bonus if you will but they did lose chad thomas they lost rj mcintosh that was kenton moten another guy up front so they lost a couple of those guys up front but they add a lot of talent in that area as well nesta silvera who's going to get a lot of reps at dt he's an incoming freshman gerald willis who was on the squad a couple years back took a year off he's going to be back so they kind of have a nice foundation there they have john ford who's a developing defensive tackle who came in last year and made some big plays at times. He'll be back. So they got some talent there. You talked about the linebackers in particular, Shaq Quarterman, Zach McLeod, and Michael Pinckney. They'll all be in their third year starting. They all came on campus as true freshmen, and just the trio of them started. They have a wealth of experience. Shaq Quarterman's probably one of the best linebackers in the country. They all kind of have a little different attitude, if you will. Shaq's kind of that even uh Mike Pinckney is kind of more of your aggressive, violent type of lineback hitter and Zach McLeod kind of feeds in there as a third guy that encompasses the two. So it's kind of interesting to see how they feed off of each other. And they've played a huge part into Miami's defense over the last few years. And Manny Diaz loves coaching. them. Yeah. Josh white on the line from the uh, campus uh, radio and, and uh, newspaper outlets there. Uh, do we still call them newspapers even? What do we call them? Yeah. We actually it, print a newspaper still. We do print a newspaper okay. uh, once a week. It's gone down from, it used to be, uh, twice a week before I got on campus. It's now down to once a week, but there's content on as well 24 7. Because uh, that, that was uh, back in the day, of course, for us old guys that uh, love to read the newspaper. Uh, that's that's how you got your information. That's how you get your sports news from a more in depth standpoint, uh, uh, besides uh, the quick uh, glance on uh, the television. So forth was the newspaper, but I just assumed. I, I had no idea, actually, whether they actually still, these outlets that have had to transition, obviously, online, whether they still printed something, because I just don't see them anymore and haven't for years. Uh, we got Josh White on the line uh, helping us break down Miami football. And again, the, the great thing here is that Josh interacts with uh, the students each and every day and has his own take uh, for, as a student 
of uh, Miami football. So, Josh, we bring on a lot of bloggers, broadcasters, and writers that uh, have obviously moved on from college, and uh, it's great to get the student perspective. Uh, we had Isaiah Kim Martinez on a number of times during the offseason, and Josh has taken over for him. So, as a Miami guy, what are the concerns this year? Concerns-wise, it's kind of that quarterback play, like you mentioned. It was a little inconsistent last year. They're trying to take that hump over. The goal last year was to make it to the ACC championship, win the Coastal. They did the first time in program history. Now it's kind of take the next step up. So you obviously have to win the Coastal again, make it to the ACC championship, but now try and take down Clemson or Florida State, whoever comes out on that side. But they haven't really had much success doing that in recent history just because the talent on those teams. I think the concern is probably quarterback play and kind of just a little bit of inexperience. A lot of freshmen are going to be playing in a lot of different spots. In week one, you're playing an LSU team. It's not necessarily your walk-in-the-park team that Miami might play in most seasons. So it's kind of growing up quickly, if you will. They have loads of talent. This is probably the most depth a Mark Richt Miami team has had since he arrived in the recent years. So it's going to be interesting to see how he can coach them up quickly to get ready for an LSU. They play Virginia Tech on the road. They host Florida State. They've got some good teams on the schedule. It's just a matter of can they get it ready quick enough. Because you got to think in looking at the schedule, LSU is pretty much a fair match in regards to just sheer talent. If we're talking just sheer talent on the roster, it's LSU and it's Florida State. And everybody else, uh, from a matchup standpoint, if you're just talking about running 40 times and lifting weights and jumping high, that the talent's on Miami's side for the entire season. Uh, uh, how did the students interpret 2017? Because taken as a whole, it's definitely a step in the right direction, winning the Coastal for the first time, winning 10 games, getting to the ACC championship game, all the check boxes that are tangible pointed in the right direction, being a six-win team two years ago, then Mark Richt getting it to nine, then to 10, but just kind of the feel of it after the big start uh, and especially the loss to, it was not so much, I don't think, the loss to Wisconsin if it hadn't been uh, the blowout to Clemson when you weren't competitive and should have stayed within 10 to 14 points, most thought. And then, of course, uh, the disaster at Pitt leading into the ACC title game. Yeah, I think like you talked about, there was excitement in the air. They went 10-0. and 0. They were the number two team in the country. They had college game day on campus. And that's probably the most excited student fan base you've seen in a long time at Miami and that was great to see but then you have the three game losing skid at the end of the season the heartbreak game in Pittsburgh where just quarterback play they didn't really have anything going Malik Rogier was even pulled from that game for a couple of snaps as a sheriff came in to get the offense going nothing was really able to happen there then they went to the ACC championship game they got really walloped by Clemson like you mentioned a lot of people thought it'd be 10 to 14 maybe even 21 points max but it was a complete blowout. Miami just kind of settled for a field goal at the end, so they didn't get shut out. And it was just trying to – you could really see the difference in play last year, at least, between Clemson and Miami. And it was really one in the trenches by Clemson. They did all the little things right, and Miami just couldn't really do that. And that kind of went into Wisconsin that you thought two evenly matched teams. Miami kind of had a home game, if you will, the Orange Bowl at Hard Rock Stadium. But Wisconsin bullied them a little bit. And, I mean, just their running back play was really strong. And – as a team Miami couldn't really keep up with. So I, I think the excitement's still there. They love Mark Rick. I mean, the excitement's been building up since Al Golden was kicked to the curb and R Mark Rick was brought in and the wins are starting to flow in the right direction like you talked about. Nine wins to now 10, an ACC Coastal Championship, an ACC Championship appearance, an Orange Bowl appearance. But I think the next step to get the student fan base in the right direction would be winning that major bowl game, maybe winning the ACC, and obviously ideally playing in the college football playoff. Hey, Josh, a few people allude to it online. It's always an interesting question for me as well uh, when somebody's covering a team, but also, I assume, a fan of the team going to school there with other bloggers, broadcasters, writers that I need to um, maybe clarify that. But uh, Miami obviously has been what has been termed as a microwave dynasty not a blue blood traditionally in college football, but uh, just going back to the early 80s and then just dominated uh, for the next 10 years and then another pocket in the early 2000s. So were you a Miami football fan before you stepped on campus? Um, and how far does that go back? Do you remember any of the glory days? Uh, I was not a Miami fan. I've kind of been 
been taught those traditions that come along. A lot of my close friends grew up in Miami, kind of taught me that. My parents did not go to colleges that had prominent college football programs or college sports programs, that being said. So I didn't really have a college team growing up. This was kind of the fit for me that worked out really well. But, you know I mean, just kind of trying to catch up on history, you kind of take it all in, you talk to as many people as you can, ranging in age to get their perspective, whether it's some of the students that went to school in the 80s and 90s or even older fans than that that have kind of been through the ups and downs and you kind of get the gauge, you get the sense of the fan base. I've talked to fans that were that stayed from start to finish of the 58 nothing loss against Clemson and that life heard in this fan base not really being back to where they expect to. And a lot of people talk about, is Miami back? And when you talk to a true Miami fan that's been through the ups and the downs, they won't tell you Miami's back until they win a national championship. And that's kind of the way that I see it too. I think that's a very fair way to look at it because you talk about maybe not necessarily like a blue blood, but a team that's had tremendous success throughout a large period of time. And they're just trying to get back to that. Yeah, Josh White on the line. Uh, he runs both the newspaper and the radio station there on campus at the University of Miami, Miami Hurricane, and also WVU, WVUM 905. Uh, Josh, uh, that being the case, uh, I find it very interesting since I came up through the ranks in a very similar fashion uh, in terms of uh, television, radio, uh, on campus. Um, can can you kind of take us uh, – through your your normal days in covering uh, Miami sports, not just football, of course. Football gets so much attention, but uh, the basketball team, very good. Uh, the baseball team, usually very good. Uh, just the, the sports day, uh, how many people are on staff? How do you guys, uh, you know, just in regards to workflow and procedures and, and how you're covering these teams and what you're doing and, and what you're doing as a staff? Uh, I find it kind of interesting, even if nobody else does, but they should. Uh, because this is how sports covered is covered today. And I'm sure I'm going to find elements that are traditional to going back forever. And then other things that obviously speak to uh, the day and age that we're in with social media and so forth. As a staff, we'll try and operate as any newspaper would in the area, whether it's the Miami Herald, the Sun Sentinel, the Palm Beach Post, the list kind of goes on and on. You mean we have people at practice, they're watching practice, they're writing reports of who's out there, who might be injured, who's doing separate drills on the side, what they're seeing from QB play, things of that nature. So we're right there with you know, I mean, any other newspaper doing exactly what they would be doing. We're there for the post-practice post interviews, taking videos, taking quotes, asking questions, getting that all down. We'll go to Mark Rick's weekly press conference. We'll write, you know I mean, we'll do features. We'll write post-practice recaps. I mean, usually the way that Miami practices work is they'll kind of be a theme for the day, if you will. The Players that are talking that day will all be offensive players, or it'll be a quarterback, a wide receiver, and a lineman, and you'll get Thomas Brown, the offensive coordinator. So it kind of forms a story for you, and you talk about the Miami offense that day. And, I mean, that's what every other newspaper is doing. So the thing that I think that we do kind of cool is, like you talk about, we provide that student perspective that, ma that not many other people will see. Um, and I think the other thing that we do very well is from a – updated standpoint we provide a lot more social media stuff so i mean you obviously get the old school newspaper in the next day and people will post it online within an hour or two of when practice ends but we do a lot of stuff on twitter and things of that nature that are seen up to the minute so people can kind of feel that they're at practice almost how large is the staff both radio and newspaper so the sports staff for newspaper uh, we're probably anywhere from 15 to 20 writers on um, that transition on what type of commitment all depends on the person, the availability they have, the flexibility they have. On the radio side, I run the sports department there as well. Um, that's probably more of a staff of upwards of 20 to 25 in that area. Um, and that might not necessarily be more day in and day out coverage. That's more of game day coverage. Um, but you're still getting people that are going there. They might not be providing the content on the radio side day in and day out, but they're seeing it just as much. Very cool. Josh White, uh, sports editor, sports director, both the radio and a newspaper there on campus for the University of Miami. It's the Miami Hurricane. It's also WVUM 905. Um, Josh, in looking at um, the schedule, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. Uh, Miami has, in most recent years, 
taken uh, the light touch early in the season before hitting a Notre Dame or somebody else out of conference. And most likely their toughest games early being actually conference games, but one of these more dynamic attention getting kind of games right out of the gates, LSU and Miami, I get a ton of comments um, here about it. Uh, that has to get uh, the fan base charged up, the students charged up to have, even though the game's not going to be on campus, to have that kind of game out of the gate to test the football team. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Miami fares like you talked about. They usually play some weaker non-conference opponents the first few weeks of the season before they get set for those conference matchups. And it's on a Sunday night at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. It'll be interesting to see how Miami responds being away from home that first week. For I mean, they usually play some of those weaker opponents, especially at home as well. But Mark Richt has made it an emphasis on scheduling some of those harder opponents earlier in seasons. They're going to play Florida the following season. They'll play Alabama in the near future, those early weeks. And I, I think these, I mean, the kids that grew up in Miami that are now Mark is recruiting year in and year out, they're excited to play in those games because in order to be one of those top teams in the country, you got to show that you can beat teams from any conference, you have to show that you can beat teams from any conference week one or week 13. So it doesn't really matter when you play. So I was going to about to ask this question in a more traditional way, but we're much more connected now than we ever have been, of course, uh, whether that's uh, there's no isolation on campus. There's no isolation in the outer world to what's on campus, as you mentioned. Uh, may, you may have the best outlet uh, and connection to the outer world with uh, exactly what you're saying, as aggressive as you guys are uh, on the social media. So uh, you're probably aware, you're definitely aware much more than I am, but I hear it every day about Mark Richt, just in regards to the expectations of him being the guy to get you to that elite status, which, as you mentioned, most Miami fans would say, well, the standard has always been national championships, so we're not going to be satisfied till we get there. And uh, I get uh, both sides of the Mark Richt coin on, wow, he achieved quite a bit at uh, Georgia. They consistently won 10 games for 15 years. Uh, he was a bit unlucky in losing a couple crucial games that could have gotten him to national championship games. And just look at the track record record at Georgia. Look at the improvement at Miami. We're headed in the right direction. We didn't even touch on recruiting. That's currently top five in the nation, something in that range. I don't know exactly, and it doesn't matter right this second. But the recruiting is obviously much better than it was two to three years ago. So there's all the positive Mark Richt, and then there's the knock that he lost big games at Georgia. He didn't get it done. He may not get it done here. Maybe he's too nice of a guy. He's not the Nick Saban, Urban Meyer uh, that demands respect and, and gets the job done in that fashion. Uh, just your thoughts about Mark Richt and, and what is the, the, the popular uh, take on the Mark Richt uh, approach? I think Mark Richt is loved among the Miami fan base. Obviously, you hear all the negative talk about he can't win the big game. I mean, he didn't get it done at Georgia like you're talking about. But if you actually look at his bowl record, he's above 500. I think he's now 10 and 6 or 10 and 7 in bowl games. So he wins them more than he doesn't. Um, that being said, that's not necessarily your conference championship game. That's not necessarily a big time bowl game or it's not your national championship game like you talked about. But I think it's going to take him a few more years. He's already done wonders, as you can see. He went from nine wins to 10 postal championship and orange bowl appearance. One thing that's a few recruiting classes where it's his guys on campus, the entire depth chart, and that's starting to develop. I mean, this junior class that's still here, that's his recruiting class. So the freshman, the sophomore, and the junior class are all his. He's still working with guys that aren't necessarily his, but he's developed those players really well. Jaquan Johnson, one of those guys who's regarded as one of the best safeties in the country. I mean, that was not a guy that Mark Richt recruited, but he's developed him into a much better player than Al Golden did. So you look at guys – like that, and that kind of shows even Malik Rogier, for instance. You know, what I mean, he might be a little inconsistent, and that's what we saw last year. But as Mark Rick's reputation goes, he's very well known for developing quarterbacks. And he took a guy that probably going to back up his entire career, turned him into a starting quarterback that won 10 games. He's trying to win even more now, potentially lead him to an ACC championship and beyond that. So I think the consensus on Mark Rick is that, I mean, fans love him, the students love him. And it's just a matter of time when he can get those recruiting classes and compete with the Alabamas, the Michigans, the Ohio States, the Clemsons of the world. Hey, Josh, uh, this takes us back a little bit more to your role there 
and your approach and the, and the, um, the staffs uh, being students and being right there entrenched in the university and the obvious connection, uh, how much leeway is there given to uh, criticism and um, taking certain stories and, and really in interjecting a negative slant if that's what the, the opinion is? Yeah, so we'll operate just as any other newspaper would. So if there's, you mean, a negative side, if let's say someone fill in the name quarterback, those four interceptions, they obviously did not have a good day. You know, that's going to be written. There'll be quotes about from that quarterback or the coach that spoke about it. It, it, it functions just as anyone else would. So there's not, you mean, that level of bias. It's just going to be unbiased news where you're going to get the full side of the story that's presented, whether it's in the press conference or whatever the players are saying after practice, you're going to get that feeling. And it's be there'll never be a straight opinion article because then that's where you get your bias. But if you'll get analysis, you mean left and right, but it'll be backed up by quotes from the players saying, let's say they throw four interceptions, they lose by 35 points. You'll get that stat there, and then you'll also get the analysis from the players breaking down their own games. All right, uh, Josh White on the line. He uh, runs uh, both a radio and newspaper there at the University of Miami. It's Miami Hurricane. So if you just go to Twitter at Miami Hurricane, you will find uh, the Twitter page right there, WVUM905. I would assume that it's the same right there, at WVUM905. Yes, sir. Excellent. Josh, we appreciate you jumping on board. If there's anything else you'd like to hit on, uh, otherwise... Uh, we're good to go, and I appreciate uh, you uh, joining Mark Rogers TV today. Uh, that's about it. Thanks for having me on, Mark. All right. Uh, we're going to do a little house cleaning here, Josh. You can just click out anytime you'd like. Appreciate you uh, again talking Miami football with uh, the Canes and the LSU Tigers uh, set to play here in about uh, six weeks on Saturday. It's just uh, six weeks from tomorrow, LSU and Miami there in Jerry's world. All right, uh, I'm going to address the live chat, see what you guys have online. I want to let you know what's upcoming on Mark Rogers TV and what I have planned. And so I don't have it outlined here in front of me. So I'm just going to kind of do some, some off the top uh, uh, administration, a little, uh, little work to let you know what the lineup should be, what I want it to be, because you guys need to be able to count on me. And I think the more uh, successful YouTube channels, the, the viewership, the subscribers know exactly what's coming when. So I would love to address the mail. So you guys have some great comments. I've made the comment a number of times just in the last few weeks that you guys have raised the comments from 1,300 at the first half of 2017. 1,300 to 17,000 plus the first half of 2018. So that's all you. And that's me commenting back as much as I possibly can. And you got to understand that the more you comment, the less I can comment back, obviously, or that's all I would be doing and not providing content and not bringing on uh, the bloggers, the broadcasters, and the writers. So the first thing I need from you guys as well is I need your guest suggestions. So somebody mentioned, I believe it was Prince, six foot one, in the uh, chat that uh, I'm a little scarce on Clemson content. So you guys know what the analysis that I do. I'm not going to anal I'm not going to give you analysis necessarily on a consistent basis on anybody. I'm not going to sit here every week just myself and talk about Clemson football and pretend to be an expert. Do I know the Clemson personnel? Yeah, I can name the defensive line. I can name about uh, the rest, pretty much the rest of the defense. And by the time they play one game, I could name you everybody on the defense and everybody in the starting lineup. I may miss a couple offensive linemen, but I know everybody that plays for Clemson a significant role. Yes, uh, I'm not a Clemson expert. I don't have uh, the pulse on recruiting. I know where they're ranked in recruiting. I can talk for the next three hours about Dabo Swinney and what he's accomplished and what Clemson did in the past under all those coaches. I can speak historically. I can do all the things that you guys have seen and heard, but I can't be the expert on every team, meaning the day-to-day -day expert. I can talk historically. I can talk generally how good they are and who the key players are and what I think of the team and the program and the conference. 
Certainly, I give you that analysis, and I will be doing a Clemson. I'm just giving Clemson as an example. I will be doing Clemson, uh, Clemson preview and prediction here in the next few weeks. I will also be ranking their schedule against everybody in the ACC and everybody in the Power Five. Uh, but that's why I bring on guests, because they know their team specifically. They can talk recruiting, and if I get the right guests, they can talk about personnel. They can talk about the coaching staff. They can talk about the linebackers coach. Uh, they know the team through and through. That's why I go the guest route. But I also want to bring you my analysis and get you guys uh, involved in that conversation as well. All right. I say that to let you know that I don't favor any one program. Uh, how many do we still have on the line? So hopefully a lot of people get to hear this that watch me on a regular basis. We only have 15 on the line right now. I don't favor any particular program. I want to cover Purdue as much as Miami. I want to cover North Carolina State as much as I do Ohio State and Kentucky as much as Alabama. Now, two things affect that off the top of my head is obviously I'm going to cover the teams that are winning more than the teams that are not winning. I'm not going to cover a lot of Illinois football. I would like to. I have no issue with covering Illinois. I'll bring on an Illinois person. I will be cutting an Illinois schedule preview, and I will be cutting an Illinois preview and prediction. But Illinois football right now, irrelevant. I would still talk it. Uh, if I was doing this full-time, I'd probably talk Illinois football on a regular basis, meaning hit them up once a month, uh, and also probably preview the games and get a quick recap. All right. Uh, so two things affect how much I cover a team. Number one, how good they are. And number two, what guess I can get. So I've been scarce on Clemson recently, Wisconsin recently, Michigan State. Those teams need to be covered. Uh, Nebraska, we've got Parker Gabriel on the line on a fairly regular basis every couple of weeks. I would like to do more with Nebraska. Uh, Miami gets a lot of attention because you guys have made it important. But if I just focus on Miami, then I'm just uh, I'm serving you, which I try to do. But I also want to bring on other fan bases. I want to replicate what I've got with Miami and USC and Ohio State and a few others. I want to replicate that across the country. This will build the channel. So even if I jump on here and talk Washington football, they're a power they're probably the best team in the back 12. They need to be talked about. Uh, but even if I jump on here and I get crickets, I'm still going to talk Washington football because people need to find me that are Washington fans. We know that we have Washington Husky fans. They're a major program. It's not that if I get 13 views on a Washington video that they have no fans. They just haven't found me. So I need to churn out the content so that they find me and do some other things that I'm exploring right now to have fan bases find me, if that makes sense. All right. You guys don't want to hear about Arkansas, Central Arkansas. Okay. All right. Uh, checking out the chat here. The other thing is, uh, this is what I've got planned for the next, uh, well, six weeks. We kick off in six weeks. So I am way behind on previews and predictions, and I see other people giving previews and predictions. And uh, our guy, Alex Galbraith of the Gridiron Expert, uh, is knocking out his previews and predictions right now on his channel. And I invite you to go to his channel, Gridiron Expert, and check him out. Uh, the reason that uh, he's collaborating with me, and uh, there will be somebody else very soon collaborating with me here at Mark Rogers TV, is that um, I need help. So I need help more so behind the scenes than in front of the camera, although I'm sure many of you would tell me that I need help in front of the camera as well. Um, I'm just waking up this morning, actually. You can probably see that. Um, but in terms of behind the, the camera, you can imagine uh, there are production elements. You guys go to other YouTube channels. You guys see fancier productions with the bells and whistles. So I'm focusing on content. I'm focusing on discussion, debate, analysis, uh, but I need to get more focused. And this is probably a bad time of year, but this is where we are on production elements that make it dress it up, make it look better. I want to take phone calls. I want to uh, reach out in terms of branding and marketing and sales and do all those things that build the channel. 
to figure out the analytics for YouTube and Facebook and social media, Twitter, and all these other places that I'm not even present, Instagram. All right, so I need a lot of work to do that because I actually, I've got kids and I've got a full-time job and you guys pretty much can guess all of that. Uh, so I just do this on the side and I pretty much grind away at it like a full-time job. I put in probably as many hours as a full-time job. So this is to build the channel, but just me churning out content, sitting here talking to a fairly large number of people one day and next to nobody the next day, depending on who I'm talking about. And when I catch you guys, uh, that's not going to, that's organically built it to a certain extent. And we're coming up on 5,000 subscribers, but it's not going to build it long term. Uh, there has to be things done behind the scenes. So I advertised for interns on Facebook and Twitter and immediately had three responses. So I brought Alex on board. He, he um, had been on, here on Mark Rogers TV a couple of times. And even though he has a thriving YouTube channel, I appreciate Alex wanting to help me behind the scenes. So he's going to do a lot of things behind the scenes. I didn't think it was fair to him to just have him work behind the scenes. Although if that's what he agreed upon, uh, that would be great. But I want his contribution on air as well. So you've seen that in recent days and you will continue to see that as well. He provides a, a different voice voice of college football, Mark Rogers TV. Uh, so it's not just Mark Rogers, the voice of college football, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So you've got Alex on here with a different voice. Uh, we will have another contributor very soon and uh, they will provide another voice and be working more so behind the scenes again on all this marketing, branding and so forth. All right. I'm going to get through the live chat as well, but want to let you know that next up for me, I'll probably be talking to less guests between now and the beginning of the season because I need to put my nose to the grindstone and rank these schedules. And maybe nobody cares about me ranking schedules, but I love to do it. I'm already in the process of doing it. I was mirroring the Pac-12 schedules. I was comparing all of them. And basically, it's it's a tedious process if you want to do it right, but it's it's a pretty simple process. You take Washington, Washington State, and you eliminate all the teams that they both play, and you're down to about four games that differ. So you compare those four games and say, well, this is obviously a tougher schedule than that. Boom. But you have to do that with a hundred and. You have to do that with about 70. I'm doing the power five plus the independence. And so anyway, I'm going to get you schedule rankings very soon. Then right after that, I really need to kick it into high gear because I'm going to preview and predict every team in the country. So I should have started that a while ago, but uh, here we are six weeks away and I got to get to all the power five. I would love to do every team in the country, but I just don't think it's possible. So I will get to the power five. So you're going to see less guests. And it seems like you guys, every time you respond to me, want to see more previews and predictions and lists than anything. So not necessarily guess all the time. So less guess, at least uh, in the next few weeks, uh, except for to, to give us updates on fall camp, because once these teams go to fall camp early August, uh, we're not going to know much unless somebody gets severely hurt. We're not going to know much for a few days. And then about halfway through camp, we start to get a feel for way things are leaning uh, out of fall camp for any particular position battles or any other news or changes in the program or changes uh, upcoming for the season. So we need to get that. So somebody had mentioned Clemson and Pigskin Pete, Bobby Durkins and Brian McKnight. I think that was Prince six foot one. And I'm going to go after those guys to talk Clemson football. Again, I'm going to put my nose to the grindstone to do previews and predictions and schedule rankings to get you set for the season. There's about 52 other things that I would like to uh, produce in terms of content that I won't be able to get to, but will maybe in the off season. All right. What else? What else? What else? We had a winner for our giveaway, but out of respect for Alonzo Oliver, Alonzo1219, he is the giver of the first giveaway here at Mark Rogers TV. Then he should be the guy to help me present 
uh, the person who got me the most subscribers between June 15th and July 15th. Uh, there's a particular person out there. I want to see if they're online. I don't think that they're on the chat right now. Yes, and NCIS Fanatic 21 reminds me that uh, we are now 27 subs away from 5,000. So number 5,000 is uh, going to get a debate with me. So if you are a number 5,000, for anybody who follows me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, not my actual Facebook, Mark Rogers TV page, I should put it there. I put it on my personal Facebook page. Uh, but anyway, I put it on Twitter that number 5,000 gets a debate with me. That's if they want it. If they don't care, they could care less to be on camera. If they've got nothing to debate, then we'll just let it slide. And maybe I'll go to number 499 or 501 uh, if they want to uh, have a debate. All right. Navy Thomas here for the opinions. It's all good. Uh, and I appreciate any time uh, I lay it out in terms of what I'd like to do with this channel and uh, where I think I'm coming up short currently in trying to get to all the teams that you guys mostly tell me it's all good. And uh, the, the mailbag I would like to do, that would be something that I can't do this Monday, but I was thinking Monday afternoon would be the best time for me to do to review the comments from the previous week and do a mailbag, select the best comments, the funniest comments. And as soon as I say funniest, uh, George is going to go crazy now uh, to have him fill up the mailbag. But the the best comments, even if they're critis, uh, critical, uh, I read a comment to my son the other night that had us both just busting a gut uh, of somebody just calling me all sorts of names. Uh, they they didn't they didn't point to anything in particular that I had done wrong or said wrong, or any uh, opinion that I had that was wrong. They just did they just laid waste to me, and it was hilarious. So we'll just bring you comments and a mailbag. And this again may not be the best time to introduce this, getting us set for football season. But uh, it seems to be something that um, again is done by YouTubers uh, to to grow the engagement and keep that going as well. All right. <laughs> Fred. Yeah. See, see, that's the thing. Anytime we have a contest, Fred Langston joins in to say, does unsubscribing then subscribing count there? So Fred, if you want to debate me, uh, any of you uh, faithful viewers, I I'm not going to debate. I don't want to open myself up to debating a bunch of morons. Uh, and a bunch of knuckleheads and any fans. We want to run. So I want this to be something that you guys feel as though I'm a regular guy. You can contact me. I'm going to contact you back. Uh, I don't think I'm better than anyone else. So there's that level of engagement, that level of camaraderie. But at the same time, I want to be respected. So I'm not going to bring on just a bunch of knuckleheads that don't know what they're talking about to debate. You guys have been on here faithfully for quite some time. And uh, there's, I don't know, I can't put the number on it, 20 or 25 of you that I see constantly that support the channel that will make comments against me. I, I don't mind that. You can be uh, critical of a comment that I made and start some kind of discussion or debate. That's that's great. But you're respectful. You support the channel. You support me. And, and any of you, if you want to reach out to me, whether it's Navy Thomas or NCIS Fanatic 21 or Prince or Fred or Leon Hurricanes or Iron Cross. Uh, I'm just talking about the guys that I'm looking at right now. There are other ones, uh, 19 Savage. Uh, there's a few other ones. Probably, again, 20 or 25. If you guys want to discuss something, we can set a time. Contact me and send me a comment. Let me know that you want to come on and discuss blank and I'll bring you on. All right. <laughs> Knuckleheads in the chat. All right. Let, let's see what, uh, what I missed here. As I was outlining all of this. Yeah, so Fred, that's a good point. I was going to continue down that road about unsubscribing, then subscribing. That's something that I, I don't have the patience to do, but to verify the subs for the person that won the contest or any of them, you know, hopefully someday we're doing a giveaway and I say, whoever brings the most subs to me in a month 
wins blank prize and somebody gets me, you know, 142 subs. You can imagine what the number was. I think it was 11. So <clears throat> I picked up 2,700 subs last year, 2,400, 20 something. Uh, you guys do know that I've got other channels, right? Uh, they're really not worth you guys looking at because they're just a replication of what I do here. So I take the Miami stuff and I put it on a Miami channel. I take the SEC stuff, but I'm way behind and I put it on an SEC channel in Ohio State and USC. And uh, so the the grand plan would be to have kind of a distribution like SB Nation where we've got the main Mark Rogers TV channel, then we've got the ACC channel, the Big Ten, the SEC, all the conferences or the main brands, and we branch out from there. But this is about all I can handle right now. All right. So, yeah, I've, I've wondered about people unsubscribing or subscribing just to count for that particular person and unsubscribing. I got to go by the honor system unless I catch that because I'm not going to go back and track uh, the 11 subscribers that somebody got me uh, and try to look through a bunch of emails and look through subscriber lists to see if they're still there. I'll just have to trust that, uh, uh, that, that if somebody takes the time to solicit that many subscribers to have comment to me, then most likely most of them are going to stick and most likely that person supports me pretty consistently for them to be able to go out and get subscribers. I've got to trust the process there. All right. I couldn't click unsubscribe on Mark Rogers TV, even to win a contest. It would just feel wrong. Love this channel too much. Prince stepping up and Prince, you probably heard I've got your Clemson contacts right here and I will reach out to them. 26 to go. I think I've mentioned this uh, at times as well, that it confounds me that people watch my channel on a consistent basis and they don't subscribe. And then the next thought is I must be driving people crazy with notifications. You guys have heard me talk about when I used to have as of six weeks to two months ago for about a year, year and a half, I was editing these down. So I would have this conversation like I just did with Josh White and then I would uh, I would not post it immediately. It wouldn't be a live stream. We would record it. We'd do exactly what we just did, but it would be recorded and not released to the channel. Then I would go back and see, okay, we talked for 40 minutes. Did, did, did we talk quarterback? So there's eight minutes. And I would edit it down into specific segments. And then I'd re start releasing videos. And people were like, you're bombarding us with videos and I can't keep up. Plus, it was just the editing was just... <laughs> brutal uh doing all that so i thought you know what i'm going to establish the live stream it's going to cut into my viewership i'm not going to get as many views because instead of releasing six miami videos just now i've got one uh, but what i'm trying to do and if you've noticed in the last week or so is that i do whip through the video real quick and i i time stamp it to provide people with a list of topics and the times that they're talked about so that they can cut into the video if they just want to hear about recruiting or whatever it is. All right, 26 down to go. So what I started to talk about there, NCIS Fanatic 21, is people that don't subscribe. So uh, turn off your notifications. Please subscribe if you love college football. If you love college football, I can't imagine that even the big outlets are as engaging. They can't be. They aren't. Uh, and actually, we can grind down analysis here that you don't get from the big outlets. When the big outlet chooses to talk about Ole Miss once in a zillion years, yeah, you, you can find it there. And some of the 247 and rivals, they do a great job, obviously, with their specific sites covering those teams. But uh, we grind it down pretty heavily here, uh, whether that's from a national perspective, which I love to talk about, or if we've got the Iowa guy on, then we're going to talk about the Iowa offensive line. And uh, there's going to be a lot of crickets out there that don't care. But at the same time, if somebody comes across me and finds that this guy will talk about Iowa football, 
and grind it down into dust, then uh, I'm going to subscribe. So I've probably subscribed to five to 10 people. I don't really know who I'm subscribed to right now. Uh, I don't even think uh, half of them are sports people uh, just because I, I take in a lot of content on YouTube, but I don't, just don't think to subscribe. So I guess uh, I'm not uh, adhering to my own rule, but I don't specifically watch anybody's channel, but I've subscribed to a few people. I've subscribed out of just courtesy and doing them a favor because they do me a favor by subscribing. So I've done a few of those. Uh, do a lot of that on Twitter. We'll follow somebody because they follow me. Uh, sometimes if, if they've got a legitimate outlet, if they've got a legitimate platform, I just don't follow every fan that follows me uh, because I don't want to clutter up my Twitter feed. But uh, do I think that I'll reach 5,000 by midnight? So NCIS Fanatic, I've uh, picked up about 350 subscribers in the last month. So that's about 10 or so a day. That uh, leads me to believe that I'm not going to make it by today. But maybe we put on a big campaign. I put it on Facebook and on Twitter. And hopefully, again, what I was starting to say is that I'm subscribed to people and I don't even know that they produce content because however I have my notifications set up, I just don't know. Uh, I don't play with my notifications. I don't know how I'm set up on YouTube that I'm, they don't bother me. So if people out there are watching and you love college football, I just can't imagine that you wouldn't subscribe and support me in that way. And again, I say this all the time, you don't have to agree with me, but if you believe that I am putting out quality content, that I have quality guests, that at least I am doing my damnedest to provide unbiased analysis. You don't agree with it all the time, but it's unbiased analysis and it's logical and I do my homework. And that doesn't mean I never make a mistake. This I thought was crazy a couple of weeks ago. Some guy just blew into me. And even when I defended myself and explained it, he still just would not let it go. So I misidentified an Ohio State player a few weeks ago during a discussion. It was the play against Penn State in which the receiver and the defensive back both had their hands on the football, and it was a difficult call because they both had possession, and the officials had to, of course, call it on the field, and they looked at it for 42 minutes, and they had to come to a decision. So I was just alluding to that play, and I initially named the wrong Ohio State defensive back. I actually didn't even need to be corrected. I figured it out within a couple seconds and corrected myself maybe a minute later. I said, oh yeah, that, and I corrected myself about a minute later and uh, somebody just, just blasted me for not doing my homework. Well, if you're going to hold everybody to that standard that never, never makes a typo with their mouth, uh, never misspeaks, never misidentifies a player, knows everything and always speaks it correctly. So you understand another thing is sometimes people know things, but they still spit out the wrong name in the moment. Uh, like a couple I had on uh, Gracie Terrell uh, talking Kansas State in the Big 12, and uh, we were talking Kansas City Chiefs quarterbacks. And just because Alex Smith and Kirk Cousins were being discussed at the same time in regards to free agency or being traded for one another. And those two open quarterback spots, I had them kind of linked in my brain. So real quick, I mentioned Kirk Cousins being the quarterback of the Chiefs. And then I corrected myself within like five seconds. I said, oh, not Cousins. Of course, he went to Minnesota. Pat Mahomes is the new starting quarterback in Kansas City. Now, some people would then call me <laughs> up and and just blast me for misidentifying the Chiefs starting quarterback, which I didn't do. I had a slip of the tongue for five seconds. That kind of stuff's crazy to me because anybody can misspeak. And even if you watch the major outlets, believe me, I work for one. There are mistakes made multiple times a day. All right. NCIS Fanatic 21, sharing this stream to Google Plus. I appreciate that. I don't even know how you did that. Uh, Google Plus is a mystery to me in that uh, I've got my podcast connected directly to Podbean. They're my provider. 
And so what I basically do for you guys that probably just watch these and don't go to the audio, but I strip the audio and I post it on Podbean and I'm usually a day or two behind and I'm going to have to correct that during the season. That's just another pain in the side, but I have to have audio out there, but I just strip the audio from these conversations and I take them to Podbean and then they get redistributed to iTunes, Stitcher and Google Play. And I have not been able to find myself on Google Play. NCIS Fanatic 21, if you can find me on Google Play, please let me know. I've had a couple of people that tell me that they found me on Google Play and I'm supposed to be linked to Google Play. But if you were able to share the video as well, that's great. So uh, that's maybe another thing you can let me know, NCIS Fanatic 21. Is there a way for me to connect to this directly to Google Play to have my videos uh, posted there? John Cater. I'm just sick of the disrespect to Alonzo 1219. Mark says nothing about this. All right. So, John, I can address that. All right. So, Zoe and I connected on social media several months ago. No, it was sometime during last college football season. So, it's been probably nine or 10 months. And I believe I reached out to him. I don't think he reached out to me. He was aware of me and had come across my channel, I believe. And uh, I just saw him as just another voice, another uh, guy that was passionate about his team, uh, approached it from a different way. And I just thought, I have a Miami contingent and I want to hit Miami football. Cam does a great job. And it's uh, in its own league on certain levels in certain ways, but I would like to get different perspectives. Zoe is a fan of Miami football. He's knowledgeable on every aspect of Miami football to a degree. I think we know what we get with Zoe. He's a passionate fan. He understands football. He does know the game. He can watch a game. So there's a difference between having knowledge of a team in terms of you've memorized the personnel, you know, the stats, you, you know, the workings of the organization and who the coach is and that you've got head knowledge, book knowledge of that particular team, or maybe all of college football versus understanding football. So I've got a buddy who doesn't care anything about college football or the NFL, but he watches football. So he doesn't care to know who the personnel, but he understands football. He can watch a game and tell you what's going on. So you have those two different. So Zoe gives us a little bit of both. He understands watching football, analyzing football. He also is very familiar with Miami personnel. He is not going to be able most of the time to give you analysis on the most recent recruit or target or signee uh, to the Miami football program. He's not going to know the backgrounds and the hometowns of every, uh, again, he has a channel that serves a certain purpose. He's going to hit the broad topics, the big topics. He knows the players that are in the system that play on the field. He's not going to know the guy that redshirted that uh, uh, is going to play for the first time this fall, maybe on special teams, and give you a complete background on him. Um, so the criticism on Alonzo, I'm great, glad that you brought that up, John. That... Uh, <laughs> Who's John Cater? I don't know who John Cater is. I know that he's uh, made a comment here that needs to be addressed concerning Alonzo. So I would like all of you, anybody watching, anybody, whoever watches Mark Rogers TV to be courteous and respectful of guests. Don't take direct shots at them personally. You can take all the shots you want. They have laid themselves out for fair game in regards to their analysis. And if they don't, if they don't meet the standard of being able to analyze a team or college football in general, uh, there's a way of letting me know that, that you don't appreciate that guest and you can do it in a respectful way to say, Mark, that person's not the best guest. I would prefer that you bring on A, B, and C uh, to analyze Georgia, for example. So hopefully 
I pointed that out and explained that in the right manner that I would like to have my guests uh, conduct themselves uh, in a certain way in regards to bringing it uh, and have you guys respond in a respectful way. So not every guest that I bring on is a complete expert on college football or even on their team, but there might be a reason why I bring them on. I would say that I bring guests on for three particular reasons and hopefully a combination of those three. Number one would be knowledge, insight, perspective, ability to communicate knowledge and insight on that team. Even if they're completely unknown, if somebody had zero platform, if they had no website, if they had nothing, but in some way proved to me that they had great knowledge and insight and could communicate uh, on any particular team, I would still bring them on here because it would be a great discussion and maybe they start to pick up a following. Number two, that person's a celebrity of sorts. So they are helping me gain influence and credibility and they are reaching an audience. So I've had people on like Phil Steele and Taylor Rooks and Peter Burns and Jerry DiNardo and a few other people that don't come to mind right now who are have a larger audience because they're on a network or online uh, to a larger degree. And maybe it's taken on a different type of conversation. It's more about their career, how they approach their job, that sort of thing. And maybe if we talk about a particular team or we talk college football, it's kind of light because maybe that's not their area. And I've had a few of those people on. So their influence helps me. People want to watch them. They're going to retweet and repost the video and it brings more attention to Mark Rogers TV. Hopefully, in addition to them being a celebrity or having some level of influence, they also were knowledgeable. That usually usually goes hand in hand, but not always. So those are two huge reasons that I have people on the show. And the third factor would be the entertainment factor. If somebody's entertaining or they have a certain feel or vibe uh, and may not be the most knowledgeable, they're not like a beat writer anything like that, that they have complete command of the personnel or the roster, but they provide some level of insight, then I go into the interview knowing that's the type deal I'm going to bring across on that particular segment. So hopefully all that makes sense. Uh, certainly there are people that I've had on here that I respect them as people and they're nice people, but I haven't invited them back. And if there's anybody that I've had on in the past that no longer comes on, don't assume that that's my decision. Sometimes they're just too busy or they stopped doing whatever they're doing or they just don't have time or they don't respond to me anymore, whatever it is. Uh, but other people, I have chosen not to have them back on because at times I've had somebody come on to talk whatever their team is and I know more about their team than they do. And unless they're extremely influential or extremely funny or entertaining, I'm not gonna have them back on because I know more about their team than they do. So why have them on? Okay, what are you guys talking about here? What's your cash app to support? Don't have a cash app, I'm working on Patreon. John, if you could uh, give me some suggestions on a cash app, I gotta admit, I don't even know what that is. So if you could, uh, uh, and, and if you guys have suggestions for guests, please uh, make that a regular comment. I did catch Prince's comment about the Clemson guys that he would like to see. But uh, a lot of the chat, once it posts, yeah, I can filter through the, the, the live stream and find your comments. But it's also difficult uh, to find it that way. So if you could just leave me a comment of what guests you would like to see, you guys. Uh, so So that's... That's my main deal when it comes to guests and what teams I cover. I think you guys get it. I'm going to cover the biggest teams, the best teams, the biggest programs, the teams that are winning. That's first and foremost, but I'm also going to favor the teams that I can find guests for. So with that combination. John, Mark, you're the best. Thank you for addressing this. What's your cash app? 
Yeah, John, you'll have to explain that to me. And John, it's it's uh, great to have you. Welcome to Mark Rogers TV. And since you are on the line commenting, I would love to know how long you've been watching the channel. Panther Pro 22, Mark, I've been looking at uh, running back films so I can put together a solid top 10. And Damian Harris really stood out to me, even over Dobbins, Taylor, and Dylan. So I'm guessing Panther Pro 22, this is your aim to uh, have a discussion here. So certainly you have earned that right. So if you would like to go to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, send me an email there and uh, we can set up a time. I'm up here struggling just a bit today. I don't know if you guys can catch. I basically rolled out of bed and went to the live stream with Josh and uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to work through it. I haven't had a thing to eat or drink or anything besides a little bit of water. So, uh, all right. One suggestion for you who might help. Uh, blah, 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 blah. One suggestion for you who might suggest help for Mark. Find the new guy on the block. Sports writers, that is. Find the new guy in the block. So, Navy, I got a fifth let you know that I don't follow the logic. If I'm reading that correctly, why would I want to have the new guy in the block? So the other aspect of that is most of the people that I have on, they have Twitter accounts and they retweet the post and hopefully bring more attention and more viewership to the segment. George, I've been watching since my handle was, yeah, whatever that was, I could never figure that out. And then I went to Bull Gator, and then I just put George once I figured out how that works. Okay. George, you're something else. Uh, I appreciate the comments from George. George says some things that are just uh, uh, indescribable. Uh, the wit. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes things are funny because they make absolutely no sense. So that's George most of the time. The other times they do make sense, and they're still funny. Uh, the old guys, sports writers, are already set. Uh, so this means that Navy, we'll have to talk about this offline. All right. Uh, what else do we have here? Baseball honors, Medal of Honor heroes. NFL still wants no anthem. Uh, you guys are talking about something else. I would never take a personal shot at a guest. I might take a shot at their team because that's what makes college football fun, of course. So don't get me wrong here. Uh, you guys know I'm not a big trash talker kind of guy, and I'm not representing a team. We had Uncle Lou on last week. So what Uncle Lou does is great. Uh, he's a big Georgia fan, and he's explained this to me, and he's explained this to the viewers the times that I've seen him. He's going to talk up Georgia football, and he's going to let people know that they're going to beat everybody 100 to nothing. But he also likes to provide unbiased analysis, and he tries to be as unbiased when he addresses another team as possible, unless he's just trash-talking somebody else, most likely in the SEC. I don't do that. You guys have found out who my favorite team is. I wanted to keep that under wraps. Like Part of me wanted to uh, keep that under wraps uh, just because I didn't want to be, okay, then my opinion and my analysis is taken out of context because everybody knows who I'm rooting for. Uh, and I think with a number of people, the way they commented back when they found out I'm an Ohio State fan, that that I'm biased toward Ohio State, and now they found it somehow obvious and that they wouldn't watch because I couldn't be fair. Okay, let's all understand that 99% of the broadcasters and writers and analysts out there are rooting in their minds. They are rooting. They graduated from a school. They were a fan of a particular team their entire lives. And regardless of what they say, they root. They want a particular team to win. They can put that to the side. I've put it to the side to say Penn State belongs in the 2016 college football playoffs. Ohio State did not earn it. I got blasted last year because I stuck up for Ohio State and believed that they should have been selected based on their Big Ten championship and more quality wins. And I was blasted when people found out I was an Ohio State fan because they put that those two together. 
Mark's going on a rant because he's an Ohio State fan and he's putting in Ohio State over Alabama and he's blind to Alabama being better than Ohio State. And a lot of people didn't listen to me say Alabama is probably better than Ohio State. And I was saying that at the time, but I was saying I'm not into judging teams based on who I think is better. This whole illusion of we're going to put the four best teams in the playoffs. We don't know who the four best teams are until they play one another. And only one plays one in one and four and two and three. If you want to go by the seedings, play each other. So if you can, I, I know some people don't just don't agree with that. And their, their logic is, well, most people can agree on these are the four best. And, uh, but I look at track record and resume and think the conference championship should mean something. Uh, John, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, that troll that collects the money when you go to trip trap after his, uh, whatever you guys are talking about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Leon's a bit lost. So nobody on here is disrespecting. I'm not really talking to you guys who watch me all the time. I'm not talking to you guys at all. I'm just talking to random there. There were a number of people who disrespected Zoe who trashed him. Uh, and there's people that make random comments and shots at me, but that's always going to happen. Look up an ESPN video and people are taking shots at Kirk Herb street and, and David Pollack and Jesse Palmer or whoever. And that doesn't mean they know they don't know their stuff. You just have to be able to blow that off. I, I'm just asking that that be, that's not, people aren't going to adhere to that and that's fine. I'll take whatever comments I get. I think they're funny. The only thing that uh, that bothers me is when I get misrepresented, when somebody criticizes me for something that I didn't say or they completely take it out of context or they believe that I don't know something that I do know uh, because they heard it the wrong way. That's really the only thing I get offended by, but that's going to continue to happen as well. So I need to be as clear a communicator as possible. That's what I can control. Don't get upset with the things in life that you can't control and control the things that you can control unless it involves another person. And then that's a relationship thing. And that's maybe another channel. All right. All right. Let's, let's take this thing from the top and scan it. Uh, Miami's got the number two recruiting class behind Clemson. Need more Clemson guys. We're getting after that as soon as we get off here. We've got, uh, so next week we've got Big Ten Media Days and we've got Pac-12 Media Days and I've got people lined up already. And uh, it almost just gets in the way. Do you guys, so here's a question. So I just ripped through as much as I could get to with SEC, Big 12 and ACC Media Days. Maybe I could have done a little bit more. Uh, I still had a number of people that uh, either didn't show up or canceled on me. So also understand that sometimes you guys will get a notification and it will say team a eight 30 Wednesday night. And then you guys like nothing happened. That means that person didn't show up. That's another reason to get out of the game of having too many guests on and relying more on my own analysis and these live streams and straight interaction with you guys is that it is a pain to book guests. I reach out, they get back. We can't make that time or this time or that time or this time. And then about 10% of the time they don't show up. All right. North Carolina getting themselves into trouble again. I caught some of that. Uh, NCIS fanatic, you crack me up with uh, this ownership. Uh, he mentions every time whoever I'm talking to, the Ohio State wins against that particular team. Got to remember the losses too. So Ohio State, Miami, of course, the 2002 national championships, the big one. 
They actually played in 1976. So this is about three years before Miami got good and the Buckeyes beat them only like 10 to nothing in the shoe. Okay. Then more recently, they played in 2010 and 11. The Buckeyes won at home, but they lost the next year, the Luke Fickle season in 2011. So you got to take note of that, NCIS Fanatic, because we are unbiased here at Mark Rogers TV. So we have to note Miami's win over Ohio State in 2011, 24 to 6 with Joe Bosserman at quarterback. All right. Yeah, let's tee it up. Iron Cross, I can't, can't agree with you more. It will be so nice to actually watch football and then get on here and talk about what we just saw to be able to say, oh, we've got fresh material. Can't wait. Can't wait. LSU, Miami, Notre Dame, Michigan, Virginia Tech, Florida State. Even that Thursday night game, I am looking forward to watching Northwestern Purdue on that Thursday night. Who else is playing that opening weekend? There have to be some other good games. Alabama, Louisville. Do you guys think Louisville's got a shot in that game? I tend to think that's that's got 42-17 written all over it. You guys let me know. Abe is a Kane fan, but LSU ain't no Indiana. Iron Cross pointing out that uh, aside from the Saban era at LSU, and it rings true for the most part, LSU has been little, little of a contender on the national scene or even in the SEC, aside from Nick Saban. I know you'll quickly say Les Miles won a national championship in 2007, of course. That momentum, not necessarily the players, he recruited just about all those players and signed them, was uh, Nick Saban generated, established. LSU, we talk about LSU as a true power, and they are from the standpoint of the buy-in from the state, the support from the area, the recruiting, the talent in the South, of course, but specifically in Louisiana and where else they recruit in Florida and Texas in particular, Mississippi. LSU has a number of the check boxes filled in that speak to elite power in college football, but they're missing a few others. I started watching college football in the late 70s. From the late 70s until Nick Saban hit campus in the year 2000, LSU aside from a couple of seasons where they jumped up with an, a nine and two type of season, they threw out a ton of six and fives and seven and fours when they were playing 11 game seasons. Nick Saban stepped on campus. They instantly started to win the second season. They won the sec and went to the sugar bowl and annihilated Illinois who had no business being there, but they earned the right but talent-wise had no business being there. And the program took off, and Saban won a national championship, and Les Miles was able to maintain the momentum and go to two more BCS championship games and win one. And so LSU was prominent from 2001 to 2011 based on record, and then I think that there was a carryover when you just get to a BCS championship game and you don't free fall like Oregon just did but you maintain some level of consistency and LSU had the talent, uh, but kept losing games, key games and maintained a top 15 status record wise. So I'm saying LSU nationally prominent from 2000 to 13 or 14 started to get the feel of, okay, we're going to see this over and over and over eight and four, eight and four, eight and four, eight and four. Are they still nationally relevant? Of course they are based on a lot of measurements, but based on being a serious contender in the SEC and to win a national championship, well, that stopped in 2012-13. So that's pretty much the history of LSU football, recent history. We could go back to Billy Cannon and the Halloween night run, whatever they call it, the ghost run, run against Ole Miss and him winning the Heisman Trophy and LSU winning the national championship. 
All right. Where are you guys? Hey, Mark, did you get that question I asked? First week against a non-conference opponent, Power 5 team. How do you feel about that? I don't know what you're alluding to, Fred. If you could ask that another time. Uh, the, the chat is difficult to, uh, to track here for you guys that have questions, especially once we're uh, past the guest. All right. Leon says it's all good. Iron Cross, you're doing great. Love the show. Mr. Rubicon, seeing Mr. Rubicon for the first time. I would love to know how long you've been watching Mark Rogers TV because this is the first comment I've seen. And we got uh, Fresh 3542. We need better tight end depth and defensive tackles. I believe he's talking about Miami. Uh, Lamar Stevens, man, I thought you were about to say less miles. I'm here for the opinions, Mark. It's all good. We've gone past that. Uh, NTIS fanatic 21 bringing up 62 to three and 56 to 14. That's got to have Navy Thomas eight feeling real good right about now. We also have to take into consideration that 2011 game NCIS fanatic that was uh, Braxton Miller getting hurt. Buckeyes took a like a 17-point lead, blew it. Nebraska comes back and wins, I believe, 31-27. And then they rematched in Urban Meyer's first year in Columbus, and that was a complete rout, 62-38, something in that range, 62-35 Buckeyes. They didn't play in 2013 or 14. When did they play the next time? They played that 62-3 game in 2016. I can't believe that they didn't play between 2012 and 2016. Nebraska, Ohio State. thought they played one other time in there, and Ohio State had its way. But they definitely had it their way in 2016 and 2017, those two games. Even the 56-14 game was not 56-14. It was like 56 to nothing, and then Nebraska scored two meaningless touchdowns. I mentioned uh, Zoe and the giveaway and the prize and that I would like to have him present to be able to give away the prize because this is all due to him. He is kind enough, good enough, regardless of what you feel about Zoe's analysis. This man comes on my channel and promotes Mark Rogers TV. He promotes Mark Rogers TV on his channel. So I have nothing but good things to say about Zoe. He is not a beat writer. He does not follow the Miami program from the standpoint of personnel breakdowns and learning where the players are from and what their recruiting rankings are and what their 40 times are. He doesn't digest all of that. He's not that type of analyst. He watches all the games. He rewatches all the games. He knows what he's talking about. Big picture, uh, positional units. He'll talk about it. You know what you get with Zoe. And if you can appreciate it, if you can understand it, then you should appreciate it. But I need to have Zoe on to announce the winner of the contest because it's all due to him. I'm not paying him a penny for him to supply swag for the first ever Mark Rogers TV contest. That's the kind of guy Alonzo1219 is. All right. Uh, I don't know that I've missed anything here. George has been busy working, but I'm listening. Great show. Keep up the good work. George working today. And uh, we've got about 25 subscribers to go to get to 5,000. And number 5,000 will be here at Mark Rogers TV if they so choose to debate me on something in college football. I would love to be able to reverse my subscriber list and see who my first subscribers were. So that might be many of you. I'm close to 5,000. So they're, they're subscriber number one, whoever that person is. Unfortunately, for any of you that have YouTube channels, look at your subscriber list. And if it's only like 12, then it's, then it's easy to filter through. But they show you the most recent, and then the list goes back from there. And they don't have a setting to show you the first. So one night I thought I'm going to go back to the start. And I went page after page after page. I probably went, think about this, 30 pages 
but that's only like 900 people. I would have had it. I did it forever. And I just thought I can't get back to the first subscribers. Unfortunately, maybe, maybe that I'll give that to one of the, um, the people on staff. One of my folks on staff can do that and find out who my first subscribers were print out maybe the first hundred. And I can give you guys some credit for being here from the very start. Uh, Navy Thomas eight, who in the hell would diss Alonzo? I hear you. All you have to do is look at the Alonzo posts here at Mark Rogers TV, our discussions and look at the comments and, and you'll see, uh, the last couple discussions have been the worst, the worst for comments coming into Zoe been bad. George says, thank you for the timestamps. All right. John was getting after me there. Didn't think I was going to address uh, that. You guys have to realize that I don't see everything on the live chat. So if, if, if you give me some kind of suggestion or comment or ask a question and I don't address it, I think I've proven myself to respond to as much as possible. And when I get 9,000 comments in a month and that doesn't count the live chat, I'm not going to respond to all of them. I, I pick and choose and I give it a glance and uh, I'm trying to give you guys the best channel possible. Uh... <laughs> ben Pratt's been joining us uh, for a number of weeks here at Mark Rogers TV and maybe before that. All right. Who's going to be the Clemson quarterback? I think this is going to be similar to the Mark Richt decision with Miami. Dabo Sweeney's going to select Kelly Bryant as his quarterback. I would be a bit surprised if he didn't. I wouldn't be shocked. But just because Trevor Lawrence is the most recent five-star, Hunter Johnson being the one before that, understand that Kelly Bryant had did a nice job of handling this offense through the regular season in the ACC championship game. The Alabama game really exposed his weaknesses and really exposed his limitations downfield throwing the ball. But I think Dabo is going to go the safe route unless we see something in fall camp that we're not going to see that Dabo sees that, okay, Trevor Lawrence is the better quarterback. He is the bigger ceiling, the higher ceiling. He has the bigger arm. He's going to be the better player long term. Plus, he's grasping the offense and he's making the right decision. So he's step in step with Kelly Bryant there. Plus, he gives me this. Then maybe he pulls the trigger and uh, selects the best player. Don't assume that Trevor Lawrence is going to be the better player than Kelly Bryant. Kelly Bryant had a good season last year. He had a rough go against Alabama, and that was partially on the offensive line, and that was partially on his receivers not separating. Now, his play was not good against Alabama either. I get that, but don't compare him to, Sean, to Deshaun Watson. There may never be another quarterback at Clemson who can match what Deshaun Watson did, specifically in those two games against Alabama, against the best defense or one of the three best defenses in the country what Deshaun Watson did against Alabama. When have we seen that? We saw Johnny Manziel do it once. The other game was more a come from behind. So the second time Manziel played Alabama at Kyle Field, the score looked good. I believe it was 49-42, but Alabama had as much as a four touchdown lead in that game. And it was generally two to three touchdowns. And Johnny threw it all over the place and put up a lot of yardage and he did make some great plays in that game, but he turned it over a lot and Alabama really ran away from that game. And so that wasn't like the first matchup in Tuscaloosa where Johnny Manziel was Johnny Manziel and stole the college football season in one night and the Heisman trophy and beating Alabama and playing just a razor sharp game. And man, that's been uh, 2012. That's been Six years ago, and then Manziel followed it up with another big season in 2013. It's been that long for Johnny Manziel, five to six years ago. Can you believe that? That I was sitting in front of the same laptop, or actually it was a different laptop. 
uh, talking about Johnny Menzel five to six years ago. The guy was something else in college. He really was. The U is back. I'm from Manchester, Connecticut. What part of Connecticut are you from, Mark? So my job brought me here. Uh, it wasn't my job at the time, but the people that hired me brought me to Connecticut. Uh, that would be ESPN. I live in Torrington, Connecticut. I've been here for 17 years. All right. Uh, we're carving through those notifications uh, off topic, but the new Navy quarterback is being highly touted. Yeah, I uh, have heard the same thing. I don't know anything about him. Then we've got all these Zoe comments. It's too late to speak up, Mark. It's too late. Okay. All right. Anything else I missed? And uh, we're going to get a running back list from Panther Pro. We've got Prince talking about Clemson's quarterback coach said they are considering a two quarterback system at the beginning as well. They will still use Kelly Bryant for red zone packages when Lawrence takes over. I was at the Clemson spring game front row. Trevor Lawrence is the real deal. He can, he ran off Cooper and Johnson who were both five-star quarterbacks for a reason. Manzel, Fran Tarkenton, wannabe. And he was Fran Tarkenton, Iron Cross, for two years at Texas A&M. He was, he was pretty special. Didn't have the, men, the mental makeup, the emotional makeup, or maybe the physical size and stamina to play in the NFL. We know what was the demise of Johnny Manzel first and foremost. He wasn't mature enough. Secondly, probably didn't have, he still could have been a quarterback in the NFL. If he had the emotional and mental makeup and maturity of other, we could list a ton of quarterbacks, somebody who's currently successful in the NFL, even somebody who's not known for that, Matthew Stafford, somebody like that. He didn't have to be Tom Brady or Pate Manning uh, in terms of maturity and film study. But if he would have just been the average NFL quarterback when it came to mental and emotional preparation and maturity and leadership, Johnny Manziel could have been a quarterback in the NFL, maybe a backup or a quarterback who got spot starts for a bad team. He, he could play the position to that level. I saw enough at the NFL level to say, okay, Johnny Manziel, he can be one of the 96 quarterbacks in the NFL. Three deep on every roster, 32 teams, 96 quarterback spots in the NFL. Johnny Manziel could be one of those guys. So Prince says Trevor Lawrence is going to be the starting quarterback at some point this season. So Prince, you are much closer to the situation on Clemson than I am, so I'm going to take your word for it. I would just say that uh, I would not be surprised if Kelly Bryant starts game one and keeps the job until Dabo sees something that shows him that this kid's not going to beat the big teams in the big games come playoff time. Clemson has Florida State. They've got uh, Texas A&M. And those are the two games that are going to be the biggest tests. And I only list Texas A&M because it's out of conference on the road. But Texas A&M is basically on par with Louisville and NC State. And whoever Clemson plays in the other division, I don't remember besides Georgia Tech who they have this year. I don't think it's anybody special. I think it's Duke. So it's Texas A&M, NC State, Louisville, Florida State. Those are the four games to be concerned with. And of course, they've lost to Syracuse and Pitt the last two years. So you never know. Manziel was definitely physically talented enough for the NFL. Kickoffs, unfortunately, Navy Thomas 8, yes, are going to be a thing of the past. They're exciting. Uh, they're just too dangerous and have been deemed as such. Clemson does have a pretty easy schedule. We will find out when I rank all the schedules. 
All right, guys, it's been great. Again, I want to let you know that, um, and, and maybe one note of feedback that I would like to get in addition to all the regular stuff where I want to hear suggestions on content and on guests. So bring those my way as always. Uh, so I tried to hammer SEC, Big 12, and ACC media days as much as I possibly could. In the SEC, I got to just about everybody. Maybe not specifically, but I brushed through them on particular conversations and then had specific conversations on Texas A&M, Arkansas, and LSU, and Tennessee. And through the Big 12, I got to everybody, but Iowa State and Kansas and maybe Texas Tech, but talked about all the contenders in the Big 12. The ACC, I pretty much just got to Miami. I was supposed to be uh, on with Jeff Greenberg from North Carolina to talk Tar Heels this morning, but uh, that didn't work out, unfortunately. So I was a bit light on the ACC. I have reached out to uh, our guy James Coleman from Gridiron Now on Florida State. So you, do you guys care about what is talked about at these media days? If not, I will focus on the season. I will focus on previews and predictions because those are going to take a ton of time. And of course, my baby, the schedule rankings. Next offseason, I've got to do schedule rankings sometime around spring football or maybe do it right after spring football. I should not be doing schedule rankings four to five weeks before the season starts. I shouldn't do that, but I'm still going to do it. I'm a glutton for punishment. Wisconsin has an easy schedule. Well, they do have Michigan this year, as they did last year, and they've got to go on the road for Michigan, and they also have Penn State, and the division's not bad. I know the Big Ten Western Division gets slammed, but it's full of a lot of legitimate programs, not elite powers. It's not the Big Ten East, but Minnesota's usually decent. They're usually fringe top 25. Iowa's usually right in that same boat, fringe top 25. Nebraska's usually fringe top 25. Now I'm talking two or three years ago and before that. Uh, Northwestern's been good. No, you're not going to run into Michigan, Michigan State, Clemson, any elite teams in the Big Ten Western Division. So the schedule's not great for Wisconsin, but it's better with the addition of Penn State and having to go to Michigan. It's a little bit tougher than last year. All right. So guys, it's been good. We got to the wholesome one jumping on. We'll have to catch up with you soon, sir. And I uh, appreciate everybody else jumping on the line. We will have schedule rankings coming. I am personally attending American Conference Media Days on Monday and Tuesday. You'll see reports from me there. And also we'll have to cover the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Uh, next week, schedule rankings, previews, and predictions are coming. Uh, you're going to see Alex Galbraith, the gridiron expert, here as well. Time for me to eat, do some other things, and uh, work on those schedules. And we will see you guys soon. Again, I am committed to a live stream on Sunday at 4, Monday at 6, Wednesday and Thursday night at 7. Those are all Eastern time. And you guys know me, I'm going to jump on the live stream a lot more than that. Uh, but I'm committed through the summer until football schedule to Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Mark it down. Four on Sunday, six on Monday, seven o'clock on Wednesday and Thursday. Those are Eastern time. We will see you guys soon. Appreciate the support. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And remember to tell your family and friends that we're here. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football.